So, before starting, I want to say that for me and for us, it's a pleasure to share this briefing with you. And today we're going to talk about the radiological response to treatment in the hepatocellular carcinoma. But before to see the clinical cases, we talk about the RISIS criteria. The RISIS criteria are the response evaluation um, criteria in solid tumors and our criteria that we use to evaluate the treatment if it is working. So, um, in a few words before I see the next slides, um, we pick out some lesions and in divide into groups, uh, the target lesions and the non-target lesions. After the treatment, we study those lesions that we pick it up and so we see if the treatment is working. In this case, we talk about the RISIS 1.1 that was a, a revised uh, guideline from the RISIS 1.0 that came out in the early 2000 years. And I say this because the most important change uh, between the RISIS 1.0 and the RISIS 1.1 is that the target lesions in the 1.0 were 10 lesions and a maximum of 5 lesions per organ. And in the 1.1, it was seen that uh, if you de decrease the lesion from 10 to 5 and the maximum at 2 per organ, the overall response uh, minimally changed. So uh, from, now, from now on, with the RISIS 1.1, you choose only 5 lesions for target lesion. So a target lesion is a lesion that has to be in the diameter at least 10 millimeters in the long axis, as we see in the image. And we can study uh, the treatment also with the chest X-ray, for example, but to, st to study a treatment, the response to treatment, you for sure use the CT scan. And you need at least uh, uh, not more than five millimeters of slight thickness. The only exception on the target lesions are the lymph nodes. You, uh, you have to select the lymph nodes that on the short axis need at least 15 millimeters, so more than 10 millimeters in the other lesions. And when you pick out your, your lesion, you have to study the, um, the follow-up not more than four weeks after you started the treatment. So you risk to mystify the, uh, the follow-up. So uh, we talked about also non-target lesions. The non-target lesions are all the lesions that you can select after the five lesion of the target lesion. So our lesion that you can uh, pick out are also non-measurable. So you can say if there is or there are not those lesions. And for example, a non-measurable lesion could, uh, could be the pleural effusion. You could say if there is or there is not a pleural effusion, if there is a trace of pleural effusion or a large pleural effusion. And if you see some lesions that have a diameter less than 10 millimeters or a lymph node on the short axis with a, a diameter between 10 and 15 millimeters, you can pick out as a non-target lesion. So you can select those lesions and uh, put on your schedule for the study to see if in the follow-up there, there will be this lesion or not. So how to choose a uh, target lesion? For example, we see uh, in the first, on the upper image a liver with a lot of lesions. So there are more than two lesions because I said before that you have to um, select a maximum of two lesions per organ with a five target lesion for all. So you, for example, you can select two lesions in the liver, one, liver in the, one uh, lesion in the lung, one on the kidney, a, a maximum of five lesions. In this case, on the liver, there are more than uh, two lesions. So you select the lesion uh, in, um, in, for the diameter. You select the most, uh, the longest diameter for uh, the lesion. So in this case, uh, we see in the lowest image, that uh, we'll pick out two lesions with the longest diameter on the long axis. And another important thing to say is that when you, for, when you select those lesions, you have to pick the most reproducible lesion, because when you do the follow-up, it's better, it's easiest to, to you to have the most reproducible lesion to see the treatment is working. So uh, we have the response criteria on the target lesions and on the non-target lesions. In the target lesion, and after we see some uh, examples, we have the complete response, partial response, stable disease, and progressive disease. To talk about a complete response on the target lesions, you need the total disappearance of all your target lesions. So for example, in the last image, we saw, we saw a liver with two lesions. To talk about a complete response, you need those lesions to disappear. A partial response occurs when you have uh, at least uh, um, it decreases on the sum of the diameters of your lesion because I forgot to say that when you pick out your lesion or as target lesions, 
you have to measure those lesions on the long axis, sum all the diameters, and after you get a number that you will start in your schedule to see if it decreases or increases. In the case of partial response, you need a decrease of the 30% to talk about a partial response. Uh, progressive disease occurs when you have an uh, increase of the 20% on the sum of the diameters of your target lesion, and you have an absolute increase of at least 5 millimeters on the sum of the diameters. The stable disease is neither the partial or the progressive, so it's a stable disease. In this case, we, have, uh, we can see in the upper images uh, on the left a uh, blood carcinoma that after the first follow-up, after the first time point, we see that it totally disappeared. So in this case, we can talk about a complete response. And the same is for the lymph node on the obturator region on the right that we see that after the first follow-up, totally disappears. So this is the case of the uh, complete response. This is an example of the partial response. In the upper images, we have two, target, two, two lesions on the liver with two different slices. The first one is 4.6, and the second one is 5.4, for a total of 10 lesions, uh, 10 uh, centimeter of lesion. In the next follow-up, you see that um, the, the, um, the lesion decrease of uh, measure. Right now, it's like 6 centimeters, so a decrease of the 40%. In this case, it's a partial response. Here we talk about the progression disease. It is an, uh, we can say an important thing about it. On the first image, we see a lung cancer of 2.8 centimeters. After this, the first follow-up, we see that the treatment works because the lesion is 1.3 centimeters. And we can talk about a partial response. But when you do the second follow-up, the lesion goes up at, at 1.7 centimeters. But you can talk about a progressive disease because the increase is of the 20%, but you don't have the absolute increase of 5 millimeters because the difference is 4. In the third follow-up, we have an increase at 2.0 centimeters. In this case, we can talk about a progression disease. These are the criteria of the non-target lesion. As we said, if in your study you have more lesions, for example, and you can at least uh, um, pick out five lesions, select five lesions, the other lesion you can choose as non-target lesion. And you don't have to measure them, you have to mention them. So you can say if there is or there are not uh, more lesions. And to talk about a complete response, and as we saw before, you, have, you need the disappearance of all the non-target lesions. And for the progressive disease, as we thought uh, before, you can talk about an unequivocal progression. So, for example, if you have uh, pleural effusion, and you, if you see that during the treatment, the pleural effusion goes from a trace to a large effusion, and you have the cytological exam that confirms there is a malignant lesion, you can talk about an unequivocal progression of the non-target lesion. Can may happen that um, during the, the treatment, may occur that new lesions can appear. So if you don't have this, those lesions in the baseline, you uh, may talk about a progressive disease, but you need to be sure that these lesions are more than one centimeter. Because if they are more than one centimeter, you can know over as a, a, a progressive disease, but you have to see if those lesions disappear in the next follow-up. So you have to stay to be careful during the follow-up for the new lesions. The lesions may split or coalesce. If the lesion split, you have to measure all the single diameter in all split lesion and you sum the diameters. The same is for the merged lesion. You have to measure, to measure only the longest diameter of the merged lesion. The best overall response is the best response that we have in our study. So for example, we talked about the target lesion group and non-target lesion group. We have the baseline lesions. After the first follow-up, they took cure after six or 12, between six and 12 weeks. If we have, for example, on the target lesion, a partial response, and on the non-target lesion, a stable disease, our best overall response will be the partial response. So we do this until the end of the study. And right now we introduce the m resist because today we're gonna talk about uh, epidocellular carcinoma, and the m resist the m stands for modified. Uh, the MRE resist uh, came out after the resist 1.1 because uh, when you study the liver, it may happen that the, the tumor doesn't shrinkage. So you could think that the treatment is not working. But there is not because uh, maybe uh, the treatment is working. There is uh, the necrosis of the tumor, but it increases on its volume. 
So we introduce a main concept, the viable tumor. The viable tumor is the part of the tumor that enhances in the arterial phase. So after the arterial phase that we used to study the hepatocellular carcinoma, we see if there is or there is not an, a viable tumor. And as we see in the image, there are two lines, one orange and one green. The one orange is due to the rhesus 1.1. If we use the rhesus 1.1, we could say that there is a bigger lesion than on the, when we study on the m rhesus with the green line. Because we are studying the viable part, and we see better in the next slide what does it mean. And we introduce also specific amendments, because it could happen that during the study of an epitocellular carcinoma, in the 80% of the cases, coexist with a cirrhosis. So if it uh, happens that you see an ascites that, compare after, that appears after the, uh, the, the um, treatment start, you have to know if the cirrhosis is benign or malignant, because you have to see if it is due to the cirrhosis or to the hepatocellular carcinoma. So, uh, the most important thing that we say, talking about the viable tumor, are the definitions of typical and atypical lesions. A typical lesion is a intrahepatic uh, hepatocellular carcinoma lesion that shows intratumoral arterial enhancement, the non-rim-like enhancement that is um, specific for the hepatocellular carcinoma. It could happen that in the lesion, you, in the liver, you find some lesion that have the rim enhancement made to the um, immaturity neovascularity of some lesions. And you can choose those lesions as atypical. In the atypical lesion, you choose all that lesion that don't respect the rules of the typical lesion, like the non-rim-like uh, non enhancement. So, um, other important assessment with, that we do in the target lesions are that we also study uh, always the longest diameter of the viable part. But it's really important to be careful after the treatment that you continue to study the viable part because we see in the images that in the upper images with the red line we can uh, measure the viable part. In the lower image we see that the lesion is less enhanced. But this is not that the treatment uh, work and uh, you don't have to, to measure the lesion anymore. It's due to the change in hemodynamics after the treatment. So the lesion stays there. So it's, it is really important to use the, the right time to the contrast. So uh, for this reason, I put it, uh, these uh, tips here to say that you need to use the right contrast time when you study an epidocellular carcinoma. You have to use a late arterial phase. And you can understand it when you see it the portal vein also enhanced, um, and you uh, for sure see the hepatic arterial branchies. You don't have to see enhanced hepatic veins, because in that case we have the uh, portal phases. So uh, we, have, we have to be sure that we are in the right phase. So we talk again about the response criteria, but this time in the m rhesus, always about the target lesions and non-target lesions in the next slide. Right now, to have a complete response, we need the disappearance of all the viable part of the tumor. And, uh, for example, could happen that in your study, you pick out some atypical lesions. In that case, you need the disappearance of all those lesions that you still measure on the longest diameter, not in the viable part. This happens only in the typical lesions. The partial response and the progressive disease are the same with the same percentage, uh, like the rhesus 1.1. But uh, you also know that there is right now the concept of viable part, so you have to be careful about this. The non-target lesions um, have to disappear to talk about uh, with the non-target lesions, yeah, to talk about a complete response. And the progressive disease, for example, as we said, uh, may happen when you have an ascites that compare during the treatment and you see that there is a malignant ascites. So for you, this is an unequivocal progression. Um, other important tips about the non-target lesions are that when you, when you study um, a non-target lesion, you don't need to, to measure only the viable part. You have to measure also the necrosis part because you're not talking about a target lesion. So with the non-target lesion, you still use the measurement like the rhesus 1.1. And another important issue is that when you have uh, malignant thrombus on the portal vein, it may happen that uh, this uh, enhance. If this lose enhancement, this is a complete response as the, uh, with the non-target lesion. And the importance of the cytological exam, we, uh, we saw it, we did this before. So uh, it may happen that the new lesion compared during the follow-up on the liver. 
In this case, you need, uh, as we see in the A image, there is an arterial uh, phase new lesion, but it's too small, it's under one centimeter. So you continue your study. And if you see, like in the B image, that the lesion increases volume, in this case, you can talk about the progression disease. But you, you take the first time point to the compare of the new lesion as the A point in the first image. So right now, uh, I turn it over the word to Dr. Bargellini, and she will talk about the therapies in a hepatocellular carcinoma, and after we will continue with the eye resist. Okay. Awesome. Very, very good. Very good. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, do you know how hepatocellular carcinoma is treated generally? So we have here uh, just a scheme. You have local regional treatments like ablation hemoembolization, radioembolization, which is a radiotherapy. And then today we have numerous new systemic therapies uh, that are more or less divided into tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like sorafenib, lenvatinib, cabozantinib, anything that ends with IB, IB. And then we have the new immunotherapy that everybody knows. Those usually end with AB, like bevacizumab or so on. Um, and what we, we will see in the next uh, slides, in the next half an hour, more or less, yes. is uh, how this, the, the type of treatment in change, uh, changes also our findings in imaging and how we interpret tumor response depending upon the type of treatment that the patient has performed. Okay? And we will start with uh, some quiz questions. So you would raise hands to vote. Is that okay? Okay. So first case. This is a patient, HCC, treated with chemoembolization with drug eluting beads. What is the response? Complete response, raise hands. Partial response. Okay. Someone stable disease? No. Progression? No. So he was very good in explaining to you that you have a viable tumor. There is no measure here, but you can understand that it's a, a residual that is less than, uh, that is more, let's say that the necrosis is more than 30%, so the viable tumor has, uh, uh, is less than the baseline diameter, and this is partial response. Okay. What about this other case? Again, it's chemoembolization with drug eluting beads, Baseline, two lesions, and then at one month. Can we vote? Complete response. Everybody has to vote, eh? Okay, complete. Someone says partial response. No? Stable? No? And progression? No. And so, but what do you think, what is that rim of enhancement that is surrounding the lesion? Is this tumor? No. Okay, it's similar to what? Do you, have you ever seen other, two, sorry? Similar to, just pick up, don't worry. No, no. <laughs> But it's, it's a rim of enhancement that you usually see after another type of treatment in hepatocellular carcinoma. Is that? Okay, so, okay. So it's a, it's a rim of enhancement that is very, you know, it's thin and uh, uh, you, it's in arterial phase, so supposedly it could be viable tumor. Well, do you need, you need to see the portal phase that I'm not showing to you. But this is a ring that is frequently seen also after ablation, and is a sort of a, a, a reaction of the tumor to the treatment. It's a sort of inflama inflammation around, surrounding the tumor. This is not tumor, okay? And you have also here a small air bubble that may, you, seeing this air bubble, you may think that the patient has, for instance, an infection. What would you ask the patient? Fever, okay, exactly. Or pain, fever, or anything else. The patient is fine. This air bubble is frequently seen after drug eluting beat taste. It doesn't mean that it is an infection unless you have other clinical signs of infection. Okay, very good. 
Now we have two cases, case one on the left and case two on the right. And you have that dense, you see that uh, you have uh, in the upper side, I need to move more, the unenhanced, and down you have the arterial phase, okay? Both cases, unenhanced, arterial phase, unenhanced, arterial phase. So the dense thing is something that is radiopaque, and this is lipiodol, because in this case the patient has done lipiodol taste, okay? So, what do you think? What about the tumor response in case one? Do you think this is complete response, partial or complete response? Raise hands. No. Complete response? Someone, okay. You, someone wouldn't know, I think. Would you like to see something else to know what it is? Okay. So the other case, is this the same case, do you think? Are they similar or is there something different regarding the lipiodol? One is very dense. Is the other one as dense? Exactly. So it's not that dense. You have some areas that do not uptake. Well, this is something that in M resist you will not find in the recent, uh, actually, upgrade there is something on. But when your lipiodol is not that dense, you have to suspect that there is still tumor there, even though you don't really see it in the arterial phase. And in fact, this is complete response. This is actually partial response. And in fact, if you look at the case, the same patients one year later, you have the one patient underneath, you have the uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which is preferred for lipiodol taste, because in that case, you don't have the radiopacity of lipiodol. And as you can see, unenhanced arterial phase, you don't have any uptake in the arterial phase. Do you see that? So that's confirmed complete response. In the other case, instead, uh, no. Okay. So in the other case, instead, you have right underneath the tumor, there is uptake today after one year, and that's recurrence of tumor because this was a partial response. It was not a complete response. Okay. And in fact, there are, besides m resist there are also other criteria that have been proposed by other authors. For instance, in Japanese authors have proposed this response criteria, RESICL, something like that. And they say that when lipiodol is used, you have to have a dense and homogeneous accumulation of lipiodol if you're using CT. Better if you do follow up with MR, because in that case, you don't have that problem, OK? Now this is more difficult for first year. <laughs> so now I'll show you this other case. You have the baseline imaging right here, up, arterial phase, and down you have the portal venous phase. First of all, is this hepatocellular carcinoma for sure? No, exactly, because you should have everything. The patient was biopsied, and it was hepatocellular carcinoma, so trust me. Then the patient had performed a taste, okay? And you have, this is follow-up, unenhanced arterial portal venous phase, and you see some hyperattenuating areas in here, and you see here the reconstruction. Do you think this is lipiodol? Could that be lipiodol this way? Just raise hands who thinks it's lipiodol. Okay, no, no, nobody. Uh, do you think this is simple drug eluting B taste like the first case I showed you? Mm. In drug eluting B taste, you don't have any bright things, any hyperattenuating things. There is another new thing that is radiopaque macrospheres. So if you happen to see something like this with the, like your arterial branches that if you reconstruct they are designed by this hyperattenuating area these lines of hyperattenuation this means that you the someone somewhere has used radiopaque microspheres 
okay? And in fact, this is actually a complete response because there is, besides this hyperattenuation, there is no arterial phase enhancement. And this, they are called LUMI, this is another example. So they are radiopaque, they are not very widely used, and this is the imaging one year and a half after. Because remember, then these spheres remain forever. So you see that the lesion, basically you don't see the lesion anymore, it has shrunk, and you still see these microspheres that now are closer together because the lesion has shrunk. So they are getting closer, okay? And at the end, it almost seems, seems like a calcification. Now, <laughs> so, getting more complicated. Ablation. The first case, up in the upper part, you have the arterial phase, and down you have the portal venous phase. This is, do, do you see something that is similar to what I showed you before? The rim enhancement, exactly. So this is what I mentioned. After ablation, particularly after microwave ablation, it seems, you have a rim of enhancement. And what you see in the portal venous phase is that basically it's still hyperattenuating. There is no washout. You know that in HCC you have arterial washing, portal or delayed phase washout. In this case, it stays hyper. So no washout. This is inflammation. Hmm? What about this case, this is again ablation. You have this area of ablation and all this uh, enhancing area in the arterial phase. No washout. What is this for you? Is this tumor? Hmm? Exactly. Why? What do you see here? Exactly, so it's an area of alterated, uh, very good, uh, of uh, uh, alterated perfusion, okay, of the, of the parenchyma, of the liver. And what's important is that at the portal phase is, is similar to the rest of the liver, there is no difference, okay? But do you see something here that why, why does the patient has this? It's a portal vein branch. Yes, this is a portal vein branch that has the same attenuation, the same enhancement as the aorta in the arterial phase. This means that there is a wrong communication between artery and vein. And in fact, sometimes when you go with a needle, you can you know, cross some portal vein branch and create a communication between artery and vein and it's called an AP, an AP uh, arterial portal fistula, okay? And this is why in the arterial phase you have this difference in enhancement. And typically, it also has a sort of, it designs a, the segment somehow. In this, so it has more or less a triangular shape with the base at the capsular level, and it's, uh, it's designing that segment that has this difference in uh, uh, vascularization. Last case, again ablation, arterial phase, portal venous phase. Complete response, partial response, what do you think? Is there tumor here or not? Yes, there is tumor because you have arterial enhancement, in this case a nodular, you have a nodule inside the nodule. And you have the washout. So this is tumor. So in other words, when you want to look for the tumor, the tumor has to have the same behavior as the initial tumor. He, he was talking about typical and atypical. If the tumor was atypical, you have to look at how it was and understand if there is still tumor. If it was typical, it's the same behavior. Or it's the same, this is for any tumor, any follow-up, okay? So if the initial tumor was hypovascular, you need to look for hypovascularity, and so on. So, complete response, complete response with an arterioportal fistula, and partial response.
And in fact, for instance, have you ever heard about lirats? They're very, they, we, now we have kirats, birats, lirats, lirats, because Americans like to categorize everything, one, two, three, four, etc. We don't. Uh, we like to describe. We are descriptive. <laughs> we do. We do pictures when we do our uh, yeah, we reports. We are artists. We are artists. Uh, however, lirats are the. Um, in the United States, they create this system to say that the tumor is lirats five it means HCC, lirats four means maybe HCC, lirats one is benign, and so on. I'm not going to talk about this, but. In LIRAS, they also propose the categories for tumor response, which are these three, and <clears throat> very unuseful to me, but they give the idea, because they say non-viable, which means complete response, you don't see anything. Uh, viable, you see the tumor, with, let's read that, arterial, face washing, and washout. If you don't have the washout, maybe it's not tumor. Okay, and then equivocal, <laughs> that's, that's the in-between. So uh, in, uh, the, the idea is to have uh, either arterial enhancement, washing, wash out, or again, how the tumor was behaving before needs to behave by now, otherwise nothing uh, viable is the uh, same parameters. Just, uh, this is not a question, I just want to show you when you're doing MRI for tumor response. I, I showed you before that lipiodol is not a problem for MRI. What could be a problem is microevaluation. Because after microevaluation, you have a coagulative necrosis that can be in, and some hemorrhage. And I don't know if you know that hemorrhage in T1 weighted images, baseline T1 weighted images, appears as hyper intense. So here you have T1 at baseline and T1 in arterial phase. Can you tell from here if the patient has viable tumor or not? No. What do you need to do now? Substract, exactly. So you, we are subtracting to take out that uh, hyper, atenue, hyper, uh, hyper density at baseline. And now you see a hole there, so there is no viable tumor. Okay, now, this is the HCC again. And you've heard before, target, non-target, and so on. So the target lesion needs to be, first of all, measurable, means that you, me and you are doing the same measures, okay? So measurable first row and needs to be at least one centimeter in size and so on. And here you have this tumor that I showed you because it's not really clear, arterial phase, portal venous phase. This area here that goes all down up to here, okay? And you have your washout. Do you think this can be a target lesion? No because it's difficult to measure, and it doesn't have, I mean, the margins are very, are infiltrative. This is an infiltrative lesion. So the problem is that if the question is, are there target lesions here? No. This is all non-target, okay? Now, this patient, because again, target lesions, remember, measurable, suitable for repeated measures, and with arterial enhancement. And possibly these have to be lesions that have never been treated before, okay? Now, if we go back to this case, I showed you the baseline and then after radioembolization. So if we use M-resist, how would you call this response? Let's raise your hands. Complete response? Someone complete response. Do you see that now you have all black, arterial phase, portal venous phase, no enhancement. So there is necrosis here. So is this complete response by M resist? Okay. But it's we don't have 
uh, target lesions. Remember that for target lesion, for non-target lesion, the complete response means disappearance of all the lesions. It's no longer a problem of viable tumor. Is that it should be it should disappear. Okay. In this case, you have the tumor. It's not enhancing anymore, but you still see something. So it is complete response, I tell you, but not by M resist. This by M resist should be a stable disease, or, or better say, non complete response, non progressive disease. It's called no CR, no PD. You don't have progression, you don't have complete response because you cannot talk about complete response. But as you said, it's not really the truth because in this case we know that the patient has responded. So, this is just to remember, to remind you that for non-target you should have disappearance of the lesion, which is not the case. But if you use LIRATS, I showed you before that for LIRATS you need to take into account the viable tumor, independently whether this is non-target or target. So what is the response by LIRATS here? A complete response, or like we say, non-viable, but let's talk about complete response. Very good. So you see here that you know at each criteria, we can be very, we can use them a lot, but in clinical practice, each criteria has some advantages and some disadvantages, and it depends on what type of tumor it is and what kind of treatment we have done, because in this case we have done radioembolization, and which is a radiotherapy, and radiotherapy has completely different effects on any tumor, also on hepatocellular carcinoma. And in fact, I'll show you some cases of radioembolization, which is, uh, I don't know if you know what it is, but it's, uh, we inject in the arteries, we inject some particles that are the beta emitters, so it's an intraterior radiotherapy, okay? So just keep it that way. So you see here, for instance, we usually start often with patients like the one I showed you before that have infiltrative HCC, and that's the reason why we do radioembolization for these cases. But when you end up either having necrosis or maybe the tumor, like in this second case, is still there, it's still viable if you want, but it's reducing in size because you have a sort of shrinkage of uh, effect instead of true necrosis. Or maybe you have a tumor like this that is infiltrative, non-measurable, and slowly disappears, okay? So it's difficult to use m resist in these cases, and we usually don't use them. Besides, radioembolization is complex because of the radiotherapy effect. And, oops, questo è andato avanti. Remember that radiotherapy is very tricky. Uh, for instance, you have here, you know, enhancement in the arterial phase. You have this lesion here that has all this rim and this enhancing surrounding, this is the radiation effect. You are irradiating the tumor, so there is inflammation there, there is edema, uh, all sorts of changes in the liver, and you always need to look at the portal and delayed phases, because in this case, what is enhancing in the arterial phase has no washout. The tumor is still there, this is still viable tumor, but anything that is around is no tumor, okay? Or maybe if I show you this case, it's even more clear. We go back, we irradiated segment four. You see here the images of the radiated area. And what, look at what you see after imaging. You have this area of hyper-enhancement in the arterial phase that remains hyper-attenuating always, also in the delayed phase. That's radiation. That's the effect of radiation, okay? So always look at the portal and delayed phases. Again, similar case, but in this case we have a, a sort of, uh, I mean, the tumor, the, the liver tends to uh, modify the, the, the margins, the, it, it retracts. You have fi uh, capsular retraction, you have fibrosis because you are irradiating the area. Think about when you irradiate, I don't know, anything else. Let's say the, the, the effects on the, on, the, on the skin of radiation. The same happens for any organ that is radiated, okay? And at the end, for instance, if I show you this case, after, uh, what, two years of radiation, see how the 
liver has changed. It's completely different. You look at the right at the light lobe. Do you see after one year and a half the right lobe the same way? No, because it's, it tends to go to hypertrophy. And sometimes you even end up with a sort of cirrhosis of the tumor, of the liver, like cirrhotic life changes. Like in this case, we have a, this was a patient with neuroendocrine tumor, so no cirrhosis. After two years from radioembolization, look at this left lobe. It's not really the same as it, was, as it was before. So you need to know that this is not cirrhosis. This is a patient that has done radioembolization or radiotherapy some time ago, okay? Now look at this case, MRI, getting more difficult. We have a patient that has done radioembolization in the right lobe, okay? Now you have T1-weighted images here. Look at the liver, right lobe and left lobe. Arterial phase, is there enhancement? No, okay. Portal phase, look at right and left. T2, and this is the equilibrium. You still have some hypo here, so maybe and some hypointensity here. And the hepatobiliary phase, you know that in the hepatobiliary phase, anything that is black, let's say, well, you don't say black, but hypoattenuating, could be tumor or could be not, okay? So, what do you think? Does the patient has tumor? First of all, does the patient have any tumor there after one year or whatever from radioembolization? Raise hands. Is there a tumor somewhere? Speak up. Bravissimo. Very good. Very good. So, why do you say that? What is this black thing here? What do you think? Is this tumor? No. Is for the fibrosis after radiotherapy. So remember that fibrosis is high point tense in the hepatobiliary phase because it's non tumoral, non functioning liver. We killed the cells here, there's nothing that works. So that area is not enhancing and it's not, uh, it's not uptaking the hepatobiliary contrast because the hepatobiliary contrast is uptaked when it's taken up when the cells are working, these cells are dead, are not working anymore, okay? So, this is fibrosis, this is tumor. This is tumor because you have some uh, uptake, maybe not a little subtle, not very clear, and you have definitely washout, which is another criteria for hepatocellular carcinoma, and tumor because it's hypoattenuating in the hepatobiliary phase, and to just help you out, you can ask for another sequence in MRI that is diffusion, okay? And now you see it clearly, because in the, in the fibrotic area, nothing. In the tumor, you have restricted diffusion. That means tumor, okay? So you, MRI is very nice because you have several things that you can look at. It's not just enhancing or not enhancing, but you have T1 weighted, T2 weighted, DWI, etc. Hmm? So, tumor in left lobe. Can I go on or should I stop? Is that okay? <laughs> now, this is a patient, an unfortunate patient with massive hepatocellular carcinoma. Just to show you. Basically, you have here tumor in the portal branches, okay, right uh, and left portal branches. You have a very um, inhomogeneous liver parenchyma. You don't even, actually in this case, you don't even know where is the tumor and where is the liver because of those cases of cancer uh, uh, cirrhosis in Italian and English and also. So... 
And then maybe there is a, a target lesion. Do you think there is a target lesion somewhere? Hmm? In the right lobe. In the right lobe. Do you mean this? Okay, it could be. Is it measurable for sure? No. Could be. Could be measurable. Okay. But it is not very, I mean, if I measure this and you measure the, I measured, but probably if you measure it, it would be different. But I took here a measurement that is 25 millimeters, 26 almost, okay? So let's take that this, this patient starts a treatment that is sorafenib, so TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And after two months, you have uh, the upper row is the baseline and the lower row is two months of sorafenib. We have, let's point it out, ascites. Remember what he said before, okay? Ascites. Look at the portal branches, particularly in this phase. You had here true tumor here, less tumor here. You see here that there is some recanalization. So the tumor in the portal branches has reduced. The target lesion is reduced by, let's say there is a target lesion, by 20%. If I move a little bit down, this is the baseline, again, ascites. The portal vein infiltration has reduced uh, above, but has increased underneath. So if we move from above underneath, less tumor there, but it moved uh, further down. And again, more ascites. Okay, this is the picture of this patient. Now, the problem is that the clinician wants to know if the patient has responded or not. And you can't really say, okay, a little more there, a little less there. He wants to know what should he do, because the problem is that when you give a response, the clinician stops or continues a treatment. So you need to know what is the effect of your report. It's not just describing. You need to give the clinician an idea. So what would you say the clinician in this case? Complete response? No. no. I agree on that. Partial response? No. no. Stable disease? Possibly. Progression? Possibly. That's yeah. exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it's more or less stable, but it's a little, maybe it's also progressed. Exactly. That's the big problem with these patients. It's exactly the problem. Why? In this case, actually, formally, formally, doesn't mean much. By M resist, it would be a stable disease. Why? Because you have one target lesion that is stable, and the non-target, which would be the portal vein thrombosis, because remember that infiltrative lesions and portal vein tumor thrombosis are by definition non-measurable and therefore non-target. So these two do not have an unequivocal progression, because progression by non-target should be unequivocal, which is a terminology that is equivocal just by, by itself because uh, unequivocal doesn't mean anything. So basically this would be a stable disease. You have stable disease of the target and you cannot say. And what about ascites? We mentioned before that by M resist or uh, pleural effusion and ascites to be associated to the tumor, you need to do a cytologic a cytology, a, a cytological analysis of the liquid to be, to be sure that you have tumoral cells inside. Because otherwise it could be related to the uh, liver dysfunction, not necessarily to the tumor, okay? So stable disease. And remember that in the majority of patients treated in any uh, big trial on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and there are many with thousands of patients, more than 50% of the patients have stable disease, which means that they, you do not solve any problem for the physician, because the physician will say, okay, let's continue and see what's going on. Next time, maybe it's going to progress. But in the meantime, next time, maybe the patient is not there anymore, or does not have a good function anymore as to change the treatment, because now we have many other treatments for these patients, okay? So uh, you have the problem of one possible solution is given again by the Japanese, that are always very you know, practical, and they say, okay, when it comes to radiotherapy or chemotherapy, 
you mix the things. Don't be too strict to one criteria. You can use unresist, you can use resist, you can even use markers, as for alpha fetoprotein, for instance. Is the alpha fetoprotein increased? Yes, okay, then it's progressed, <laughs> no matter what I say, okay? Is decreased? Well, okay, you can continue. Hmm? So be less strict and more practical. The good thing, however, is that with the new therapies, like lenvatinib, or maybe immunotherapy, atezolizumab, for instance, which is upcoming also in clinical practice, if you look at the data, and these are the big studies uh, on thousands of patients, you see that see, sorafenib has an objective response rate, which means partial or complete response, of about 10% only. Whereas uh, if you use these new, tumor, these new um, therapies, you may see a partial response or even a complete response more frequently. So uh, there is a big change uh, upcoming in the next few months. You will see also in your practice that your patients are actually responding also radiologically to a certain treatment, which is good news for them. And this is, for example, a patient that uh, has performed lenvatinib, for, uh, which is another tyrosine kinase, and you see here that has, it had all this tumor that after six months disappeared. So there is a perception of response in this case. I continue and then it's going to be his turn, sorry for being too long. This is a case of atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, the new drug. This is going to be the standard of care for patients with HCC in the advanced stage as soon as the alpha is going to pay for it, which is not the case yet. So baseline, first control. What do you think? Complete response? No. Partial response? No. Stable disease? No. Progressive disease? Progression. So the question is, would you tell your physician to just stop here and move to something else? Yes? Move to something else. Okay. I'll show you what happened afterwards. Time point two, which means after four weeks, Reduction. Okay? Remember that tezolizumab and bevacizumab. This is something that we have already seen also in colorectal cancer. In metastasis of colorectal cancer, the patients perform bevacizumab and undergo bevacizumab, and you see tumor increases at the beginning and then shrinks. So don't, the, 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 the thing is that you, as radiologists, can say whether there is a little increase but the clinician is going to continue. So don't get upset if the clinician continues with the same therapy, because he knows that it may not be a true progression, but what is called, and now he's going to talk about it, a UPD, an unconfirmed progression, the pseudo-progression. And this is frequently, not very frequently, but it has been observed uh, after immunotherapy. And I think it's your turn, right? Yes. In the next slide. So, yes. Okay. Okay. So, right now we talk about the iris criteria because we saw before that uh, we have some issues like the pseudo progression, but we have to understand what it is. So, uh, we talked about the immunotherapies that are really used today, but uh, you have to know that. Sometimes could happen that after the treatment starts, the lesion doesn't shrinkage but increase in its volume, and this may be to the pseudo progression that this is a progression that happened due uh, to the inflammatory reaction due to the T cells that infiltrate the tumor, and it results in increasing uh, the volume of the tumor. So how we can see in this image uh, with the lung cancer. In the first image, we see a lung cancer that, um, and we see this at the baseline. We start the treatment, and the lesion increase, goes up. So if we were using the RISIS 1.1, we for sure would, uh, would use the progressive disease. But at the second time point, the third time point, and the fourth time point, we see that the lesion decreases. So the treatment is working. So you have to use the right criteria to study uh, lesion. So, um, 
uh, just a second okay so uh, we see the blue line here for example this is a lesion that increases its volume and using the RISIS 1.1 here we can use the progression disease but talking about the high RISIS as we said before we talk about an unconfirmed progressive disease because maybe it is a pseudo progression but we don't know this so we go on with the treatment and we see if the treatment is working in this case it's working because the lesion passes through the stable disease and the partial response so the treatment worked after the blue line goes up again and the lesion is increasing again but you still talk again with uh, the unconfirmed progression disease because in your study you had a partial response and a stable disease so you don't know if the lesion shrinkage again after some time points so um, as we said the unconfirmed progressive disease and the confirmed progressive disease are two results that you can uh, it could happen during the iRISIS study. So you remember always the, the criteria of the RISIS 1.1. You always have the target lesion, the non-target lesion. This is the same in, uh, always in all of the studies. But there are some assessments like in the M RISIS and in the right RISIS right now. So if we have an increase of the sum of the diameters of our target lesion or we uh, compare uh, appears new lesions, for example, we better see in the next slides. We can talk about an unconfirmed progressive disease. We continue the therapy. If the lesions still increase, this is the confirmed progressive disease because uh, the most time is a real progression, but you don't know if you are seeing a pseudo progression. So it is recommended to continue the therapy at the beginning. So. Uh, to understand if uh, it is a pseudo progression, you have to do a follow up in less time. So the follow up normally is until between 6 and 12 weeks. But this time, to see if it is a pseudo progression, you do a follow up after 4 8 weeks. And you can see if the lesion is decreasing or increasing. If the lesion stays the same, you can keep the status of unconfirmed progressive disease and see what happens in the next time point or in the next follow up. So, as I said, it is recommended to continue the therapy at the first stage. So, uh, I can do it? Okay. So, um, this is a clinical case that Dr. Bargellini, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm telling for uh, this, cl this clinical case. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I, can, I can do it, I can do it. <laughs> yes, because it's connected to the confirmed and unconfirmed disease. So uh, we can see here, as we talked before, as we said before, the best overall response. You can see at the baseline that with the sum of the diameters is in millimeters, 35 millimeters. And at the first follow-up, we see an increase of the lesion until 46. And uh, so you can talk about an unconfirmed progression disease. On the second time point, you have a decrease again, but 45, so the progressive disease is not respected. You continue to keep the unconfirmed progression disease. On the third follow-up, you have an increase at 60 uh, millimeters. And on the non-target non lesion, you have a non-complete, non-partial disease. So your best overall response is the complete progression disease. So in this case, this is not a pseudo-progression. It's a real progression. As we thought before, as we have seen with the other criteria, we can talk about the new lesions in the eye resist. But in this case, everything changed because when you have a new lesion in the eye resist criteria, you had to put these new lesions into groups. You have the groups of the new lesions measurable and the group of the new lesion unmeasurable. So you start another follow-up for the new lesion and you see if these lesions are going to increase or to decrease. If in the time point, the lesion, at uh, the first time point, the lesion decrease, there are not new lesions. If the new lesions are there and still increase, in that case, you have a complete, uh, a complete progression. So, th so this is my last slide, and we introduced the concept of hyperprogression, because it could happen that after the immunotherapies, the lesion, the sum of the diameters increase more than the double of the diameters, or better, a twofold of the first time baseline uh, diameters. So in this case, you talk about an, hyper, an hyperprogression. So after you start the immunotherapy, you could have a pseudo progression, an hyperprogression, or you can have a response to treatment at the first end point. So uh, right now, uh, I turn it around to the last time the world, to Dr. Pajima. Okay. Oh.
Uh, the issue is this one, that the immune-related res response criteria, there are at least three or four different ones over the years, are really the, the thumb of the radiologist. They are terrible. So, because you need to do IUPD, ICPD, ICR, IPR, and so on. So they are really a, a nightmare. Um, therefore, we, uh, as a, a pathological community, ask ourselves if they are really uh, worth uh, the, the, the trouble. I mean, how often is pseudoprogression in HCC? Right now, nobody knows. There is this small uh, real practice coming from Barcelona. Uh, nobody knows because uh, the, most of the trials just ended with immunotherapy or they are ending. And therefore, the patients, uh, when, when, since they are double-blind trials, you don't know which uh, therapy the patient is doing, and you're not allowed to use those images for uh, your analysis. So what they did in Barcelona is just to collect 30-something cases treated with nivolumab outside of clinical trials, and they reported a certain number of pseudoprogression, 12%, uh, 10% of hyperprogression and, uh, and then dissociated responses, which is the other problem that we see in any tumor. I mean, one tumor responds and the other doesn't, so you don't know what's going on. Um, and this, these numbers, if they are confirmed, that, that means that we really need to use IRESIS, unfortunately, uh, and we need to, go to learn to use them, which is not really easy. Uh, we, in PISA and probably here too, we participate to many trials with immunotherapy and HCC, and it's really a problem for us when it comes to uh, really write down which is the tumor response. Um, just to show you, this is a patient uh, of hyper, with hyperprogression. This is baseline, very young patient, unfortunately. Baseline and baseline, and you see that after just four, six weeks, uh, starting with uh, uh, durvalumab and trimelimumab, uh, we knew that afterwards because he was uh, unblinded. Uh, you see here this impressive progression because the patient has tumor in the hepatic veins and a lot of tumor that was not present at the beginning. The patient died after a few weeks. And it seems that, in fact, immunotherapy may have in some patients a sort of immune reaction that, and the tumor explodes. We don't know why, we don't know which patients, unfortunately, but we had a few cases like this, patients that really in just four weeks or six weeks exploded, okay? And the same case, uh, you see here that even in the lung now the patient has multiple lesions. We already saw a case of pseudoprogression, and this is the other case of dissociated response that you may see also in other tumors. For instance, you have here baseline and on follow-up, this uh, arterial phase, so you don't have enhancement, so good response here. Then you move somewhere else, and you have a good enhance, uh, no enhancement here, so here it's responding. Uh, here again some necrosis, so good response, and then you move down, and unfortunately everything is responding except this lesion here. So what do you do in this case? Obviously you continue, and uh, you hope that this lesion is going to respond as well, but this gives you the idea of what, how different is this, are these tumors, also in the same person in the same liver which is something that we do not, not understand yet. And someone has told us, and we are not going to do that, that we should biopsy every lesion in the liver too, because every lesion in the liver is different. I hope this is never going to happen, but uh, it's something that we will, and if we're really moving towards the era of personalized medicine, which means that every tumor has its therapy, its therapy, then we will need to do something like that. Maybe not biopsy, but maybe we will use uh, a liquid biopsy or we will use uh, a functional imaging of some kind with new markers, uh, like CT, like PET, with all these new traces. And maybe we will understand something more. But keep in mind that sooner or later, we will have all of us radiologists will need to know how to biopsy a lesion. Because that's the future. To be a radiologist, you will need to learn to biopsy. And I don't know how to biopsy, I've never learned, 
but I'm the one, one no, so una frana con l'ecografia. <laughs> but this is something, so if you, the, the, the radiologists in the future will need to be able to biopsy, exactly like senologists do. I mean, the, our senological you know, radiologists, all of them biopsy a, a, a breast. So the same thing is something for any other thing, because they are going to ask us more and more to do biopsies. This is something that doesn't have anything to do with tumor response, but is a message. So go ahead and thanks, and he is going to learn, teach you for sure. This is the end of our story, and this is just to remind you that when you have a patient, this is for HCC, but for any tumor, you will have to know what kind of treatment the patient has done or is doing, the type of therapy, I mean, you don't really need to know any name of any drug because we're going to get crazy sooner or later, but at least whether the patient is doing immunotherapy, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, a mixture of those, or if the patient has done a radioembolization or drug eluting details or ablation, microwave ablation compared to radiofrequency ablation, because any therapy has a different finding in radiology. And this is something that is going on and on and on. Independently from single criteria, response criteria that are more for trials maybe, but remember that there are some specific points for each type of treatment that you need to know. And he has done a beautiful job.